part of the Learning to Compete project um, is the country case studies, is the fact that we're bringing together research um, from a variety of different countries across Africa and also um, in Southeast Asia. Um, and what WIDER brings is the fact that we can, we can bring in local country teams, we're working with local partners um, who bring with them um, experience, who bring with them policy relevance and context that is much needed in this type of research. Um, me personally, I've been working with the country teams in Nigeria and Uganda, and also I've been spending time in um, Southeast Asia, in Vietnam and Cambodia. Well, Vietnam's success over the last couple of decades has been pretty remarkable. Um, I think a lot of it is rooted in the, the market orientation that they adopted in the late 1980s. Um, and as well as, as being market oriented, they became very export focused. Um, so that a lot of policy over the last decade has been looking at um, becoming more export ori oriented, um, better trade policy, um, more deregulation of, of, of state ownership, um, investment policy, and making, making investment and trade um, more easy, essentially. Um, so the growth that they've experienced has been fueled to a large extent by increases in exports, um, but also by industrialization. So growth in industrial output over the last decade has been in the double digits. Um, and I think this is part of that remarkable success story. Um, this has in part been fueled by foreign investment, so more relaxed investment laws has helped in this regard, um, but it's also been private sector development. So you've really seen a massive growth in um, entrepreneurship, you've seen massive growth in private sector enterprises which are very dynamic, which adapt, um, are very adaptable, which are starting to export, um, and I think that's really a, an important part of that story. Well, to an extent, it's down to entrepreneurial cu culture. Um, there's also still state involvement. While there has been deregulation, um, state investment has been much better targeted and much better focused on sectors um, that have growth potential. So a lot of the policies within Vietnam have been sector specific and there's been sector specific policies and financial incentives directed towards areas where they feel they've got a comparative advantage. Um, some other examples include electronics, um, and more recently, kind of evolving sectors such as software development and these kinds of things. So you're seeing this transition from focusing on a focus on traditional sectors towards a focus on more higher value added sectors, um, emerging sectors and, 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 and growing sectors. And a lot of the um, sector specific policies have focused on research and development, promoting research and development, promoting capabilities. I think that we, we, can't, we can't assume that they can replicate Vietnam's success or follow the exact same path. The context, as I've said, are, they're, they're just very, very different. Um, I think that what they can do is learn from the, the types of approach that they've taken. Um, look to things like what are their comparative advantage, what are the sectors that could potentially grow in the future, um, and um, by focusing on areas where you have a comparative advantage, I think that you can, you can, you can learn a lot from that. And um, it's also about, kind of, I guess, in early stages of development, some amount of protection of your, of your sectors is required, of your firms is required, um, in order to help them and help launch them onto the world stage and launch them into um, export markets. Um, I don't think you can underestimate the value in having, in having um, a good infrastructure system. Um, you can't underestimate the value in having um, consistent energy supply, for example. These are major constraints that are facing um, African, many African countries um, towards private sector development. Um, so I think that it's about looking at how they went from, how Vietnam went from a stage where there was very little private sector development to all of a sudden creating opportunities, um, creating a platform where small enterprises can, can start, where small enterprises can grow. And I think that's really where, where um, African economies can learn lessons. Well, when we look at agglomeration, what we're talking about is the tendency for firms to locate near each other. And when we talk about agglomeration economies, we're talking about the, the fact that this can be a source of productivity growth for firms. So a lot of um, industrial policy over the last number of decades have um, established industrial parks, tried to establish export processing zones to bring firms together so that they can potentially benefit from these types of agglomeration economies. You know, they take the form of things like having access to a pooled set of labour, pooled skilled labour, for example, reducing transport costs, and also maybe just interaction with, um, with, with, with um, firms
comes in the same sectors that could potentially lead to technology transfers or technology spillovers. So when we talk about agglomeration, we're talking about this as a potential source for productivity gains, really. I think you'll always get clustering where there are natural advantages to being located somewhere. So you'll get clustering of firms um, in, in cities, you'll get clustering of firms near ports, near large infrastructure projects. You see the same in Cambodia, see it to a certain extent in Nigeria. Um, so you will see that kind of clustering. That's more like a kind of an urbanisation or maybe localisation rather than agglomeration per se. When we talk about agglomeration, what we're trying to see and what we're trying to identify is whether when firms locate near each other, they start to interact more. And if they interact more, then are they benefiting from the knowledge that, uh, that the, each of the different firms have? Um, you might expect things like technological complementarities to emerge, whereby it makes sense if these firms are all interacting, one firm comes along and wants to introduce, say, e-business practices or e-banking, then all of the firms will perhaps adapt because they're interacting with each other. I think in developing country contexts, and in Africa in particular, these types of interactions might be very important, where you have infrastructural deficits or where firms private sector firms are generally um, quite small, um, they tend to have to locate near their customers, they tend to have to locate near their inputs. So agglomeration might be even more important in these contexts than it is in developed country contexts. Um, so um, th that's the kind of thing that we're looking at when we talk about agglomeration. Um, and there's kind of two things that happen when firms cluster together. They can become much more um, competitive, so they have to compete with each other. So there may actually be disadvantages to some very small firms from locating near their close competitors because of these competitive effects. But overall, for productivity, that's a good thing because it's going to weed out the inefficient firms and there'll be reallocations towards the more efficient firms. And then the more efficient firms that are closely um, located to each other may then start to interact, learn from each other, and together improve um, their, their production processes and business practices. It's difficult to know what the policy implications here are. I think that the evidence for industrial parks, for export processing zones, there's no really strong evidence to suggest that firms within these, um, these parks and zones um, do experience these types of productivity spillovers. It seems that the evidence, the evidence that we have suggests that it's more the naturally forming clusters of activity where these types of agglomeration economies are observed. So it's where firms, the profit maximizers themselves, are deciding where to locate. They're the ones who are interacting and then they experience these productivity spillovers. So there's evidence, for example, in Cambodia that these um, export processing zones they're not very well developed yet, but the ones that are developed become very insular and they basically still import all of their um, inputs and then they immediately export their outputs and there's very little interaction that happens between them. So the way you establish these, um, these types of industrial parks and the way you establish these types of export processing zones I think will matter. I mean it might make sense for a government to set up a special economic zone where infrastructure is a lot better, where there's no problems with power shortages and so on and then allow firms to come rather than specifically setting it up just say for export firms or just say for foreign firms. Absolutely, and I mean, I think it's, it's a step-by-step -step process in, in many African countries, and this is kind of the starting, what the starting point should be in terms of reducing that infrastructural deficit. I've learned that um, bringing all of the evidence together, there appears to be a premium associated with um, exporting, and it appears that firms do learn by exporting, but I think it, again, depends on the context. Um, there's a couple of different processes at work. So the evidence is very strong that the more productive firms select into exporting. So for a firm, in order for a firm to be able to export in the first place, they have to reach some kind of level of innovation, some level of technology or some level of, of productivity where they can then access the export markets. Once they enter the export markets, not all firms learn but some firms do learn. And there is, so there is a premium to be gained from that. And there is some kind of productivity gain. Um, it seems that where you export matters, so exporting to developed countries, exporting to the EU, exporting to the US, the productivity gains are larger. And also what you export matters. So if you're exporting more high-tech types of uh, produce or high-tech high -tech types of output, then um, it'll also matter. 
But another phenomenon that we're observing um, in Mozambique, for example, is that there are many firms that are what the business literature would say are born global. Um, so it's not that they're domestic firms that then start to export their firms that establish in order to um, in order to export. So this is kind of a, a different way of looking at it and a different perspective. And these firms do have um, a premium, an export premium associated um, with with their export behaviour. And um, so I would say that on a whole, there is there are productivity gains from exporting. Um, I think that the mechanisms were getting more familiar with and we're becoming more familiar with but there's still a lot of work to be done to understand precisely when and how this learning actually happens. From a policy perspective I think that the, the, there's kind of two margins which, um, which policy makers should think about. The first is how can they um, encourage access to or allow access, um, domestic firms access export markets and this is about reducing trade costs and in many cases it's simply about providing information providing firms with knowledge um, about how to sell their produce um, and putting them in touch and linking them in with the export markets because that appears to be one of the, the big constraints that we see. And once that margin is covered, and of course these firms have to be efficient, they have to, you have to reduce the constraints that affect their everyday business, such as the infrastructure deficit, such as perhaps accessing credit in order to be able to, to invest um, or innovate or invest in new projects that will allow them access these export markets. So that margin I think is really, really crucial. Um, and then once they're at that margin and they are actually accessing the export markets, then it's about, um, about making sure that that's facilitated and that again constraints, constraints are removed. I think FDI is a very important part of the development process um, and evidence in Vietnam suggests that you know, FDI has been part of the story. Um, in many of the other countries that are involved in the Learning to Compete project, we find that there is FDI but there are very few linkages with the local economy. So FDI firms um, are investing and this creates jobs, this is you know, good for the economy in that respect, um, but they are for the most part in importing their inputs and then directly exporting their output. So there's no real linkages with the domestic economy. So I think for FDI to be a real engine for growth for developing countries, um, it really needs to, we really need to establish linkages with domestic producers. From a policy perspective, what this means, I mean, the reasons why in many cases, I believe FDI firms are not linked in is because there's insecurity of supply of inputs. They have to be sure that they're going to get the inputs that they want. They have to be of a, a suitable quality. They have to meet environmental standards. And increasingly there's a pressure um, that they have to be um, follow some ethical business practices. practices. So corporate social responsibility would have to be built into this. So this, there are gaps there. And it could be just a knowledge gap or it could be some other gaps whereby there needs to be some investment um, in the domestic sector um, to to start to tick these boxes, you know, but I would envisage that uh, um, an FDI investment project should, I believe, from a policy perspective, include some kind of uh, mechanism whereby the FDI firm would, you know, get their inputs locally, um, and I think that that's where there are real gains to be made. I think entrepreneurship is a very important part of the story and certainly has been a very important part of the success story of Vietnam. Um, I don't believe that entrepreneurship is something that can be taught. Um, I think that the recent evidence um, from various business training programs in Africa suggests that there are, there are no real returns. You can't teach this entrepreneurship, these are entrepreneurs to begin with in many cases. Um, I think that um, what it comes back down to is having policy directed towards removing the constraints to entrepreneurs actually investing, removing the constraints to small businesses from being established and small businesses from graduating from being small to being medium sized enterprises because that's where really the action starts to happen, that's really where they start to get into the export markets and so on. You know, so removing these constraints are, you know, the, what, what we've mentioned already, they're like, you know, making sure there's access to credit, um, improving infrastructure, just making the environment um, easier for entrepreneurs to actually um, invest um, in, in, in enterprise.
Um, my belief is that it's to remove the obstacles. I think that um, if the obstacles are removed and the constraints are addressed, it means identifying the constraints to begin with, right? But once they're identified um, and they're addressed, I think that entrepreneurs um, are profiteers. They want to maximize profits. Um, you know, to some extent, maybe there are sector-specific policies where certain sectors you can try and encourage. For example, you could think about the agricultural sector and agro-processing. You know, there may be some kind of mismatch of skills there that, that, that the government extension programs could address um, to promote entrepreneurship, to encourage um, agricultural producers to start, I don't know, moving up along the value chain. So there, there may be so certain sectors where there can be extension services that, that could have an impact. But on the whole, I think that it's about removing the constraints, removing the bottlenecks. Um, and I think after that then, um, as was the case in Vietnam, we should see entrepreneurship flourish.